to see everybody joining us. So we're recording now. I'll try not to narrate everything I do. Um, what do you think about starting? All right, I'll start and people can, can uh, trickle in if they're still trickling in. Well, welcome everyone to our Zoom event. Um, I wanna thank the Kellogg Hubbard Library for hosting and thank all of you for joining tonight. We have two authors with us, Chelsea Catherine. She's the author of Summer of the Cicadas. Um, it's her debut. And Thomas Christopher Green, he's the author of six novels and most recently, The Perfect Liar. Um, although he is almost finished with another novel, uh, title to be determined, I think. Um, sorry, we can't all be together at the bookstore. I'm Samantha from Bear Pond Books, um, but it's nice to be together with all of you here. And it's especially nice that we're able to host Chelsea, who is joining us all the way from St. Petersburg, Florida. A few housekeeping items. <clears throat> uh, you should be muted upon arrival into Zoom, but if not, please mute yourself. This will help keep down any background noises uh, while the reading is taking place. We are also recording tonight's reading. If you do not wish to be shown on the video, please make sure that your camera is off. And you can do that by going to the bottom of your screen. Or is it at the bottom? Yeah, there's a stop video at the very bottom on the left. Um, the video will be on social media for Bear Pond Books and the Kellogg Hubbard Library. So please follow us there and you can see this video plus others of other author events that we'll be hosting. Chelsea Catherine is a bright, raw, original new voice in American fiction. Her prose is electric and Summer of the, Summer of the Cicadas, excuse me, was a novel I couldn't put down. Um, those are words from Tom Green and I'm going to agree with him. When I read Summer of the Cicadas, I was surprised by its slightly creepy tone. Um, I say slightly creepy because of the bugs, um, but it was moody and brooding and it was just beautiful writing. And I'm very excited to be able to um, host Chelsea here for everybody to discover her great new voice. I read the book in two sittings. It's also kind of a, a slim book. So it, it's nice to have something that you know that you can commit to. Um, I highly recommend this book. I'm going to share the link in our chat box. It's available on the Bear Pond Books website. I'm going to our chat box and dropping the link so everybody can see that. Oh, and that's, I'll write down Summer of the Cicadas. Uh, tonight, Chelsea will read briefly from the book and then we'll be treated to a lively discussion with Tom Green. His latest novel, The Perfect Liar, is a riveting book with a twist and that is also available at Bear Pond Books if you're looking for um, a fun mystery. Oh, I opened the wrong thing to get my chat box. This would also be some fun reading. I'm gonna put this book link here, The Perfect Liar. So at Bear Pond Books, we do uh, in-store pickup, backdoor pickup, or we can ship anywhere in the US if you buy online at the website. The store is also open for shopping at the store. Uh, then we'll take a Q&A from the audience. You are welcome to write your questions into the chat box and then we will read them out to the authors at the end of their discussion. I'll do a quick intro for each author and then I'll pass it on to Chelsea. Chelsea Catherine is a native of Barrie, Vermont, living in St. Petersburg, Florida. She is an LGBTQ writer of fiction and nonfiction. Most recently, she won the Mary C. Moore Nonfiction Award through the Southern Indiana Review and her book, Summer of the Cicadas, won the Quill Prose Award through uh, Red Hen Press, and it was published in August. You can find her at her website, chelseacatherinewriter.com. I'm going to put that in the chat as well. Oh, I think the URL didn't take. I'll do that again in a bit. Um, Thomas Christopher Green is the author of six novels, The Perfect Liar, Mirror Lake, I'll Never Be Long Gone, Envious Moon, The Headmaster's Wife, and If I Forget You. His fiction has been translated into 13 languages, in 2008, Tom founded Vermont College of Fine Arts right here in Montpelier, Vermont. It's a top graduate fine arts college and uh, he was the youngest college president in the country at the time. He lives and works in Vermont and we're happy he can join us tonight. I'm gonna pass it over to Chelsea. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to Bear Pond and to the library for hosting and thank you to Tom for agreeing to do this with me. Um, so I'm just gonna read a very a uh, short section from the very end of the book. It shouldn't give away too much, um, but it'll give you kind of a 
a little bit of a taste of the style of the book. After dropping Maggie at Mason's house, I drive the old route home. Rocks kick up under my car. It smells like pine, like normal. I kick the corners, speeding up when I should slow down. It reminds me of high school, curving back home after prom, all cried out of tears after sitting there all night long, wanting to dance with someone but finding no one. I get home and park the car. The crickets sing their song, high and sweet. It smells like grass in summer, the heat of the sun that lingers in baked earth. I love this house, these woods, but even with the job, even with the award, with Mason, Brenda, this place is haunted. The only thing that makes it better is the ranger supervisor training I'm going to next week in DC. Sabina called me a few weeks ago and told me it, about the job it's for. I'll be working out west in the state parks as a ranger. They haven't decided where to place me yet, but most likely it'll be in Yellowstone National Park. I've cleaned the house up, trying to get something to feel right so I can leave it without worrying. I finished the insulation, I cleaned up the outside, shearing down the trees. The yard sits plucked free of weeds, green in a bloom of rain that's fallen across the area. Haze lingers over the grass, a warm ray of moisture from the wetness of the earth. After dropping my things off in the bedroom, I head downstairs. I take out some whiskey and pour it in a shot glass, set it on the counter and stare at it, but don't drink it. More and more lately, I keep pouring myself drinks that I don't drink. I've been running every day, training my body back to how it used to be. I still wake up with this pain in my chest though. It strikes me out of the blue sometimes. A warm breeze fetters in through the kitchen window, tinted with my mom's perfume. I head for my parents' room. Everything is still here, exactly where I left it, like it's always been. I walk through the bedroom to the porch and open the door. Hot air blasts me in the face. It smells like grass and wet dirt, like the days after the crash and everything that hurts bad. I lie down flat so my back is pressed into the wood planks and close my eyes. The heat won't leave until October. It simmers over the trees, the horizon of the pines. It's in the air, warm and wet when I breathe. If I imagine hard enough, I can see myself lifting into the air. I rise high above the ground, higher and higher, until I can see the tops of the trees and then the layout of the town, like a heart-shaped patch, a sea of green and gold cupped by a dark shadow of forest. Thanks. Yes, that was awesome. Hey, Chelsea. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> good, it's good to see you in person, sort of, through the, miracle, through the miracle of television. Yeah. Um, so I have I have a, some questions I prepared for you and thinking about your book and I have <laughs> and my dog has a couple too Hugo awesome um, I uh, I had a chance to reread this today and I just want you to know this is for those of you who haven't read this book please go buy it it's it's absolutely stunning it's beautiful it's a slender novel the prose is some of the best I've read in a long time and I really even felt that more reading it again today um, but I want I want to ask you about about being a debut novelist and in, in your road to publication and. When I first met you, it was a bunch of years ago. I don't remember exactly when, but you were working at Birch Grove Bakery. Mm -hmm. And I used to stop there when I was president at VCFA on my way to work and get a latte in the morning. And I came in and you knew who I was somehow, but I came in one day and you said um, really loudly the whole room, this guy is famous. I'm gonna be famous someday myself. And of course, when you said this guy's famous, I looked behind me to see who you were talking about, but um, I'm gonna be famous someday myself. And then you told me something else, which is that, you know, when you were looking at MFA programs, um, you did not get into VCFA, which is a tremendous mistake that my college made, because um, you would have been one of the finer writers to come out of there, honestly. Um, but it got me to a question I wanted to ask you, which is about, you know, when you said that to me, I'm going to be famous, and then you told me that, I thought, yes, she is. And the reason is because so much of being a writer is about being resilient about trusting yourself, trusting in your own voice, um, and handling rejection, because rejection is part of the game here. You know, I mean, we, we uh, when I was a young writer coming out of my MFA, I was writing mostly short stories. I had over 300 stories rejected uh, before I published anything. And I used to take the rejection slips, and this was back when you actually submitted things through the mail. 
and I covered my entire refrigerator with them as a reminder to me of these, these, this is what some people think, but you can still do this. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your road to publication, um, how you learned to navigate the kind of thick skin you have to have to actually do this and then ultimately produce such a beautiful book. Yeah, it's funny because I'm actually a super big baby and I cry about everything. So I surprised myself by sticking it out for so long. I've been writing since I was eight years old. It's the only thing that I've ever really wanted to do. Um, and for me, it's been the same kind of road. Um, so this book in particular, I was looking for agents before. I went to uh, direct to publishers and I had 13, I think, agents reject it. Um, I never did find an agent for it. I thought maybe, you know, it's not meant to be, maybe I'll put it aside, um, but there was just something in me and I think all writers have to really listen to their intuition um, and really listen when they have a feeling that something's going to uh, go well for them. And I had that feeling, so I kept looking. Um, in the Red Hen Press, it was a competition, so I didn't actually have to have an agent to submit it. Um, and I just submitted on a whim, said, what the heck, you know, I'll give it a try. And uh, six months later, they called. And it's kind of been like that with everything. Um, I'm agented now, but that took a very long time. It was probably the most depressing thing that I've done as a writer. I think, um, like you're talking about with um, other kinds of submissions, you'll get a attaboy here and there. You'll get, one of them will get in, you know, and you'll have that moment of like, okay, I'm on the right track. But with agents, it was just rejection after rejection after rejection. And I went through dozens before I got agented. Um, and for me, it's just one of those things of like, this is my priority. This is what I want to do. And I'm not going to let anything, you know, stand in my way. So <laughs> if that means I keep pushing, then I keep pushing. Nobody's going to do it for me. So that's been my attitude with things. What was your favorite part of the publication process? I mean, for me, it's always um, when they actually send me the, the page proofs and I can see what font they chose. It's sort of geeky, like even more so than the cover. Like I love just seeing the way they lay it out and the words and it just feel, starts to feel real then. But for you, what was it? Um, definitely when they called. So I work full time at a nonprofit and it was the end of my work day. It was like 4.35 um, and Red Hen is over on the West Coast. So it's a different time for them, but they called. And just that feeling of like, I can't even describe it. I was just shaking. Okay. Um, that was the best part for me. and. I think kind of seeing the book put together was really interesting for me, but I had such a physical picture of the story in my head. And I feel like the book really fit that. So in a way it made it less like surprising when I saw the cover and when I read the words on the page because it was just exactly what I thought it would be, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. And I, I rereading it today, I was, I was struck by how um, sensual this novel is. And by that, I mean um, sensual in the sense of actually the senses and how you, how, you, how you describe things. And I think, you know, when, when we're writers, we're trying to be conscious and seen of, of making sure we're covering all the different senses you hear and smell and, and sight and thought and all those kinds of things. But in, in your case, um, I was really struck by how smelly this book is. Like you can smell everything. It's like this, it's, it's sort of Southern Gothic, but the the smells are everywhere, um, you know, the perfume, uh, you know, just the, the woods, the, the, the dampness, um, you know, you can smell different things. So I'm just curious how you, on the, on the sort of particulars of approaching like description in prose, is it something you're really conscious of and in, in how you do it when you move through it? Yeah, so um, I get this question a lot because all of the work that I do is very sense heavy, sometimes too much sense heavy. Um, but I had a teacher back in undergrad who really, that was what she was good at. And that was what she taught to us. And some of that kind of stuck with me. And then the other part of that is that I have pretty severe anxiety. So for me, I'm constantly noticing things that I think other people may not notice. I notice temperature, I notice smell, I notice um, humidity. Like I notice things that a lot of people go through their day and they're not aware of it those are things that are like hypersensitive for me. So when I'm writing a book, a lot of the time my experience is coming out through those sense details because I'm hyper aware of them. 
So that's why I think I put some of the focus is both because it's how I was trained and because it's how I kind of move through the world. One of the things I love about this novel, in addition to that, is that it operates on a number of different levels. It's kind of a it's kind of a beautiful love story, or almost even un unrequited love story, I would say, without giving too much away. Um, you know, it's a meditation on grief, and then at the same time, it's like this Hitchcockian like horror film, where these cicadas are, you know, not the cicadas you imagine with this sort of nice background noise, but in fact they're um, kind of terrifying. Uh, like the birds, and they're descending on people, and and, uh, and and they they sort of contribute to this entire sort of Southern Gothic oppressive atmosphere uh, in the book. And uh, obviously, they're meant to be a larger metaphor for something. But I'm wondering how you thought of them as you were writing it, because um, they're so omnipresent in, in the book. Even though they're not really the topic of the book, they're kind of the background under which this other story is kind of unfurling. Yeah, well, I think it's funny you mentioned Hitchcock because I actually grew up being really obsessed with him and his films. So I used to have a poster of him that I hung on my wall and I've seen like everything that he's ever done. Um, and one of the things I like about his works is that he takes normal things and makes them scary. So like birds in and of themselves are not scary, but he kind of took them and tweaked them a little bit to make them terrifying. Same thing with Rear Window. So the, the whole scene itself and the whole idea of it is not inherently um, new or strange, but he takes these normal situations and makes them a little bit scary. And that's what I kind of wanted to do with this. I wanted to have um, something that's very familiar and at the same time, very unfamiliar. And I think cicadas are perfect for that because they're everywhere, they're all over the South. You know, I spent a lot of time when I was a kid in Louisiana, cause that's where my mom is from. Um, so I grew up, you know, kind of obsessed with cicadas and really interested in them because they are familiar and alien at the same time. And I thought this is a perfect mesh of, of things to kind of make this story just slightly creepy, not over the top creepy, um, but just a little bit wrong. So that's why they stood out to me. Yeah, it really, it really works. Um... I want to ask you about, about the role of honesty in fiction. And I, I have this thesis, this idea anyway, that you know when we really write well, um, it's because we're writing from a place of kind of deep honesty within ourselves. I mean, I think regardless of um, you know, how we use the kind of uh, fiction as a, as a window into something else or other people's stories or inhabit other people when we write, which we do, um, there is an element to it that all fiction is autobiographical and that when we really write well, um, you know, we're writing from a place of a deep well of honesty, which, which takes some measure of risk because we know people we love and care about us or maybe judge us are going to read it. And I'll give you a specific example in my own life, which is I, you know, my, my mother is almost um, 90 years old now, uh, but, you know, her older sister um, who recently passed but was in her 90s uh, was an avid reader but couldn't read anymore and because um, of her eyesight. And so my mother would call her at night on the phone and would read my books to her over the phone, which is incredibly charming and lovely when you think about it. But I was horrified by it because of some of the content of my books. And I said to my mom, like, what do you, what do, you do with, you know? And she said, well, I just skip the dirty parts. Um, and so when you think about like honesty and fiction for you, and there's, there's a lot in this book that feels very like, there's an honesty to it, you know, and a, and a rawness to it, I think is how I described it. Can you talk a little bit about coming to terms with that as an author, realizing that, you know, this is going to be a book that people are going to read as public and, and part of it, even though it's fiction, right? But part of it is, 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 is a reveal to the inner heart of how we think and how we work and what we care about. Yeah, that's, um, that's the heart of my, why I write. Um, and so I've published a number of personal essays. So my junk really is all out there for anybody to know. Um, and one of the things, one of the reasons why honesty in writing is so important to me is because I didn't have a ton of it growing up. Um, so I didn't read a lot of books that felt like they spoke to my human experience. So when I'm writing a book or an essay or whatnot, it's always scary. Like I'm always terrified of how people are gonna react and what are they gonna think of me and whatnot. Um, but I write it because I think there's always somebody out there that's gonna benefit from reading from it. 
and they're going to benefit not from me tidying up the truth or making something sound good. They're going to benefit from the real raw part of it. Um, and with this book, I remember uh, one of my best friends, she lives in Montpelier. She, uh, she read the book and she read it in one sitting and she texted me and she said, Chels, some of the things you said there, <laughs> you know, I think those things, but I would never say them. And that's my goal with a lot of my writing is like the things that we all kind of think that we're too scared to put on the page. I'm going to try really, really hard to say those things because I want to normalize it and I want to normalize certain experiences that have been marginalized. Yeah, there's a part of this book that operates as a love story and um, in, in, in Jess, Jessica has a bit of an obsession with Natasha, I think, and in, in, in there's this really cool scene where we realize that it's not, a, it's not exactly new, that it goes back to an earlier time and an earlier age when she was younger and that there's a history there and a longer history. Um, but I think the hard part for a lot of writers with sort of love and obsession and um, is, is how to not make it cliched. And I would say the same is true of sex. And, um, you know, most of us write really badly about sex, myself included, and, uh, and, and, and love is hard too, but I was struck by the um, particularness of how you approach both of those topics here. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's another, another one of my goals um, as a writer is, um, no offense to any uh, white dudes that have written about sex before, but it's a lot of dudes writing about sex in fiction from what I've seen. And I think that's changing a lot more now. Um, but I was like, I want to, I want to put the perspective of a female um, looking at another female. That to me, I feel like I hadn't read a lot of that. And there's a little bit of it. Um, you see it a lot in fantasy. And so I really wanted to um, just show the perspective and show how I think women sometimes look at women differently than men look at women. And I really wanted to, um, to, to show that and to show a different perspective of things. And for me to write about um, sexuality and to write sex scenes, this book is tame. This is a very tame book. The book that my agent is working on selling now has very explicit sex scenes. And for me, it's another um, issue of normalizing things. I've seen a lot of like heterosexual sex in books and I'm like, if we're gonna have that, we should have other stuff too. So for me, it's all about kind of um, writing things that I'm passionate about and writing things that I needed to read or need to read that I can't find elsewhere, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, how do you work? This is a question people always ask me that I don't, I don't, uh, I always kind of, kind of a funny question in a way, but, um, you know, people always want to know about my schedule and when I write and, uh, and do I write on a computer? Do I write longhand? Um, do you, how, how do you stay disciplined? Do you have a structure? Do you have, uh, cause you obviously have a job, you have other things, you find time to do this. Um, you know, how do you, how do you work? So I've always worked a full-time job. And when you met me, I was working a full-time job at um, a lobbying agency basically. And then I did the part-time job on top of that at the, at the cafe, um, but I'm really disciplined and I don't have a partner. I don't have family in the area. Um, I don't even have a dog that I have to worry about. So I really just end work and I come home, I go for a run and I write for the rest of the night. Wow. And some days I'm more focused, uh, other days I have trouble focusing, um, but I try to do at least a good 1500 words a day. Um, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I don't actually like doing first drafts. First drafts for me are the hardest to get through. But once I have that first draft, it's just smooth sailing. Um, so I work really hard to get that first draft down and I push myself. Um, and then once I get there, I can kind of uh, lean a little bit, but I think it's really hard. I talk to a lot of my friends who have children and who have, you know, elderly parents they're caring for. Um, and it just happened with my situation that I'm not caring for other people right now. And I can really just focus my time on pumping out words. That's what I'm doing. So that's how it's been for me. What can you say about the new book beyond that it uh, has a lot more sex in it? 
<laughs> is so, it a similar kind of feel genre set in the south or what can you tell us yeah so i would say it's more southern gothic than this one so this one was like real soft southern gothic for me this one is like hardcore southern gothic it's set in um rural louisiana like at the bottom of the boot which is where my mother has property where my family's from um and it follows a queer coven of women who are basically trying to save the town from this horrible jerk that is living there um, and they're all witches so it kind of follows the main character she's been suppressing her uh, powers for a really long time and it just kind of follows her coming into her power joining this coven and all of them eventually running the guy out of town so sounds like that's a good villain yeah it was just fun I just wanted to write a fun book and that's what I wanted with cicadas too I was like you know what's ridiculous cicadas you know attacking people and it was fun it was just really fun for me I'm like I just want to enjoy the actual writing of it and these are the topics that are fun for me so that's wonderful um so you have a new agent you've got a new book you're working on you've got a lot going on um what's it, how's it been so far the reception for um for this one how, how you know it's been probably pretty exciting and there's been awards and yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, it's been kind of a quiet reception in the way of um, I've had random people reach out to me on a personal level. Um, so it's not like I'm going and speaking at, you know, in front of crowds. Nobody's doing that right now, hopefully. Um, but I've been really surprised by the uh, the different kinds of people that have messaged me and been like, I read this and it, it hit for me, like it hit hard and it impacted me. Um, I had a girl from Chicago who picked it up in a library and now follows me on Instagram. And it's like, this book was really life-changing for me. It really spoke to me. Um, and I didn't expect that. I thought, you know, you write a queer book and you think queer people are gonna like it, but this is a book about death and loss and recovering yourself. Um, and it's just been really surprising and like nice to see the different types of people that are it's resonating with. Yeah, I find that I find connecting with readers is so powerful. Have you um have you have you seen reviews that were unfavorable? Have um, you seen, like, did, you, did, you, did you read them? Do you read like reviews on Goodreads or things like that or places like that? I actually don't read reviews. I I just can't. Um, I did. We I read one review and it was I think Publishers Weekly, and that was only because my people at Red Hen were like, "Look at this review," and I was like, "Oh, don't show it to me. I don't want to read really? it." Um, I don't like reading them because I'm like, look, the book is out. It's out. Like I already wrote it. You know, I can't go back and fix it. So for me, I'm kind of like, yeah, I'll take reviews before the book is published because then I can actually change things. But after I just, I have not read any of them because then I know I'm just going to want to go in and change it. So that's, um, I have to say that's so incredibly mature of you. I wish I had that little maturity <laughs> because I'm, I'm like the opposite. Like I, I, you know, I read all the newspaper reviews, the rest of it. I read the hate, I read the love, you know, but I'll go deep on Goodreads and read like, you know, what Jen from Illinois has to say and how much she hated my book. Um, you just never respond. That's the rule. But I, I find it all kind of interesting and useful to know. And sometimes I learn things from it, but I do think it's a, um, yeah, it's admirable to, to just be able to tune it out and say, you know, I, I did it, it's done, it's out in the world and that's the way it is. Yeah, I definitely... I also am very swayed by other people. I know that about myself. And that's why um, if I'm finishing a book, I try not to read other books. And I try not to have too many people like weighing in on my book because I'm suggestible, I guess, um, because I know I have a vision. And for me, it's kind of about getting that vision out untouched and then dealing with whatever comes up afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I don't read when I'm writing in the middle of a novel either. Um, but it leads me to the question of what, you know, what have you read recently or, or in the last couple of years that really kind of you're like, wow, you know, I wish I had written that. I always have that, I wish I had written that moment sometimes. I do that all the time. Um, okay, so T. Kira Madden is, she's a native Floridian. Um, her uncle is Steve Madden, the bad guy. Um, yeah. But she is an incredible incredible writer and she wrote a memoir called uh the tribe of fatherless girls and oh my god I just 
it's a long book and it's hard to get through, but I got through in, in three nights um, and I just bawled at the end of the book. There's so much going on. It's about um, her growing up and a lot of trauma and coming out of the closet and dealing with her father who um, was a criminal and being half Hawaiian and just a lot of things. Um, and so I would recommend that book to anyone. And then on the other side of things, you have Carmen Maria Machado, who is another favorite of mine. Yeah. Um, and she's written a couple of things, but the most recent one that I read was In the Dream House, mm. um, which is basically the story of an abusive relationship. And oh my God, it's so good. It just, both of those books, I would recommend to anybody. Her wife is actually a BCFA grad. Really? That's from not long ago. And, um, and I had a chance to meet her at the um, uh, National Book Awards maybe four or five years ago. So she's a, yeah, she's a superstar. What a writer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the style and um, I'd never seen a book structured the way that she structures that book. So some of the chapters are like less than a page. The mm -hmm. way she structures the book is just very interesting. The way she moves through time is very interesting. Um, it's more experimental than I think I would be able to do well. So I looked at that and was like, wow, like she pulled it off and she did it really well. So, yeah. What do you think, what do you think the hardest thing is about writing a novel? And you, you brought it up when you said moving through time, because that, that to me is always one of the hardest ones. You know, getting people in a room is hard. I mean, that's just the simple things like that in a book is, you know, you gotta, you gotta put people in the room for things to happen. But what about, what about the idea of moving through time? What is it that, that you find most challenging around working in a longer form fiction? Ugh, everything. Um, the, book, the book that I just finished was 80K. So this is like 45K yeah. and I'm naturally, short-winded when I write, not when I talk, but um, getting to 80K was hard for me because I think the length of a novel is really challenging um, and it's not for a lot of people, but for me it is. That's the biggest challenge is the length um, because when I see a scene, I see it very crisply and succinctly and my automatic thing that I wanna do is just write it very quickly. Um, and I'm seeing now with this book that I just finished of how good it can be to go back into a scene and really sit in it for a while and really see how you can um, develop the characters if you are sitting with them for a longer time. Um, but I still really struggle. I'm like halfway through a draft of a new novel. Um, it's just, I struggle with length. Um, so I'm doing the thing that I do is just get it all out there and then I'll elongate after because it's just yeah. tough. Yeah, for those who just aren't familiar, when, when you're saying 80K, you're talking about 80,000 words or 45,000 words. Um, I, you know, the book I just finished, uh, when, when I finished my first draft that I thought was actually pretty ready to go last summer, it was 67,000 words. And my agent came back to me. I actually have two agents now, weird, but two of them. They both came back to me and said, we'd like it to be more like 85,000. And I'm like, oh man, I mean, because it's like done in your mind. Mm -hmm. And to actually expand, it's not like you just add 20,000 at the end of the book, you actually have to yeah. go through and like layer and filter it in. So it really meant rewriting the whole thing. So I feel your pain on that. I think that's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely adding on half of a book. And I had to do that with the one that's um, on submission. Now I had to add 35 K before she was willing to go out with it. So um, it was fun. It was, I enjoy that, but it's tough with length for me. So we have, a, we have a question from Anastasia and uh, I hope other people will type in questions, please. Um, uh, and Anastasia wants to know, who are the inspirations for your characters? My characters. Um, so I use real people a lot, um, but in this case, uh, Mason, the sheriff is actually based on, if anybody's seen Stranger Things. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, so uh, Hopper is the cop in that series, and I love Hopper to death. And so Mason's actually based on him. Um, I was watching Stranger Things, I think, during uh, the edits of this, and I just, ugh, I love Hopper. So that's who Mason is based on. Um, there's another television character from Queen of the South that Sabina is based on. And then uh, Jess is kind of a little bit of me and a little bit of a couple of other people that I know. And the same thing with Natasha. She started with somebody that I was close with. Um, and then as the story grew, she grew into a different person. 
And I see that happening a lot with my characters. I'll start with like someone I know, and then they'll just grow into how the story needs them to be. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think a lot of us do this, and, and maybe something we can talk about a little bit in more detail. But the idea of using uh, composites of real people to create a character, and this happens to me all the time, where people will think, like an ex-girlfriend will think, like I can't believe you wrote this about me, and I'm like, that's really you. I mean, there's a tiny bit of it that's you. Mm -hmm. Like I, I gave her your car, okay, but the rest of it isn't you. You know, do you do that same kind of thing? Do you sort of meld people together and different attributes, then create an entirely new human being? Yeah, so the way I was taught to write character um, was I went with my writing teacher and we sat in the Berlin Mall and we watched people and she was like, watch how they're walking, watch how their hair moves, watch their facial hair. Like uh, she was very like, look at the close details. And um, with the woman that I started Natasha based off of, she has a lot of different like specific movements and ways that she moves. And that's why I picked her because I loved the unique way that she moved through space. Um, but then you have this outer shell and the inner shell is just, you gotta do that. Cause you never can really, I mean, we can all know somebody well, but I feel like when you're writing someone you can take their outer shell, but you have to really work hard to get the inner shell. And that's how I think I'll take people that I know their outer shell and then I grow them through the book, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. I'm wondering if we have other questions from people who are out there listening to us. So we have a we have a, um, a statement here from Rachel who says, "I love hearing you speak of the female gaze, which I particularly appreciate." And I think that is interesting. The female gaze in fiction. Is interesting. My my 14 year old daughter, by the way, gave me a hard time yesterday, having read like 20 pages of my novel that she shouldn't be reading. But she said to me, you know, you know, you've been raised at a certain time as as a male to fetishize women's bodies in a certain way, and it comes through in a fiction in the way that women wouldn't actually think. And I thought, oh, I need to go back and revise that. But um, with that as context, I mean, how do you how do you think about the female gaze in, in, in your writing and, and its importance to what you're doing? It's a really deep question. Um, there's just so much I want to say about that because, um, I mean, I wrote this book, what, three years ago, and there's so many parts of it that are really cringy to me now um, because I was still really fresh out of the closet when I was writing this. And um, a lot of lesbians have a lot of internalized um, misogyny and a lot of toxic masculinity. And I can see some of the male gaze in my female gaze when I wrote this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely changed. That's changed a lot, you know, as I've grown and as I've become more comfortable in my sexuality. Um, but what I set out to do was to look at different types of women. So the issue I have with a lot of mainstream media is you see the same type of woman over and over and over again. And a lot of my issue is that once a woman is past, I don't know, 35, you don't see them anymore and you don't see them in sexualized roles, which they don't have to be. But um, one of my big things and the thing that I do in, in the book that's on, on submission now, um, the main love interest is 50 years old, which I don't think is old, but that is... It's unusual. Not. It's unusual. You know what I mean? So to have a love interest that's deeply sexualized at 50, yeah. I haven't seen that very often. And I don't know why. And I don't like that. So that's part of my goal too, is that I'm walking down the street and I see women that are 50, 60, 70, and I think they're beautiful. And I hate that people aren't writing about them. So those are the people I'm going to write about because I'm sick of seeing the same person over and over and over again and seeing them from the same lens too that's important. Yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any other questions from people watching for Chelsea? It's hard, they're all very quiet because they're out there in TV land. Um, so when you think of the arc of your career now, I mean, you've, you've begun to, um, you know, you've begun this process, you get your first book out, you got a second coming. I mean, you know, what do you, what, what do you desire? Or do you, do you not think that way? Do you think more in terms of what's the work that's in front of you? 
or do you, or do you think broadly, you know, as you said to me one day, I'm going to be famous, but I know you would be facetious, but you know, do you think broadly about like how you're going to have a literary career and a literary life or, or how do you, how do you conceptualize that? Particularly now in an age when books are, um, are, are a little different. Yeah, I wasn't being facetious. I was being serious because one day I'm going to be big. <laughs> and one of the things that I always tell myself is, um, why do I want to make it big? Why do I want to be successful? Because I like to write. And I think a lot of the times writers forget. I think I see a lot of my friends who are in similar positions. They want to be, you know, successful for other reasons. And for me, it's always been like, this is what I like doing. I mean, I could go and work at a nonprofit the rest of my life and be okay, but what I really love is to write. So that's why I want to be successful at it. Um, and for me, it's it's been something that's been with me for so long, for over 20 years. I think you know the same feeling. If you're not writing, you feel weird. All writers say that. You know, if I'm not writing, I feel anxious, I feel whatever. So for me, I'm like, I'm just going to keep doing it. It makes me feel good. I feel like I don't always have the best perspective on things, but I have a different perspective that some people might need to hear. And so I'm going to keep doing it. That's how I think about it. So I have a question from Sam wondering, did you do any research about recovery to write about the recovery of addiction? I mean, I lived my own life. That was my uh, basis for that. I used to have a pretty severe alcohol problem. I'm pretty open about it. Um, and I'm recovering and working on it. And so for me, it was kind of watching my own change. Um, and a lot of the dark times were when I was writing this book. Um, and I actually wrote the character out of the dark times before I got there. So a lot of the times for me, writing a book is, um, I'm kind of guiding myself through something and guiding myself through uh, some kind of hardship I'm going through. It's the same thing with the love, the unrequited love story. I had a broken heart. And so I wanted to write this character getting through it. And that's what I did. Um, the major research that I did for the book was on the cicadas. And that was, um, you know, super sleuthing on Google. So, so is, that a, is that a real thing? Like, do, are, there, are there like giant cicadas that swarm and attack people and bite their faces? No, no they're the um, magic, magic cicadas are a real thing. So they do come out every 13, 17 years. Um, they don't attack. They can't even really fly very well, um, but they are attracted to vibrations. So sometimes they'll land on people if they're like mowing the lawn or something, but they're not attacking. Um, I did talk to one person who lived in Florida and she told me she'd been stung by one of them, but she's the only person I've ever heard that has ever said that. That's good. I'll sleep better because that's... <laughs> horrifying. Um, so uh, the question from Rachel Wino, were you raised with Wicca? I, uh, not formally, no. Um, my mom, I just wrote a blog post about this for Creative Pinellas, um, about genealogy. My mother claims that we are descended from the Salem witches, um, so she claims that our genealogy goes back to some of the women that were burned then. Um, so yeah, I was raised kind of spiritually, I'll say. And um, I think that comes up in my prose sometimes, and that definitely comes up in the next book a lot. There's a lot of practices from Wicca in witchcraft that show up, um, but they're kind of practices that have been weaved into my everyday life, so. Do we have any other questions from anybody out there? Is there anything, Chelsea, I haven't asked you that you think I should? <laughs> that you're surprised I haven't brought up. <laughs> no, I'm super pleased with all of your questions. They're very thoughtful. Thank you for coming up with them. You know, I have to say I've interviewed, you're the fourth writer I've interviewed in my life. Really? Uh, yeah, only the fourth, but I'll tell you who the other three were and, 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 and I'll say that you're, you're kind of amazing at this. Um, so I've interviewed Cheryl Strayed oh and God. I've interviewed uh, Richard Russo Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed Andre Deboos the third, um, and I've interviewed actually I've interviewed some, I've interviewed Ron Charles the uh, editor of the Washington Post uh, book world, but so those four in front of an audience, and so you're the you're the fourth writer. And uh, I was there when you interviewed Cheryl. You did it yeah. at the FA, didn't you? Yeah, I did. It was yeah, it was like 600 people came to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. no one remembers my role. Everybody remembers her. <laughs> it's so amazing. Um, she she was just incredible, and she's uh, 
yeah, she's an incredible person. She's a powerhouse. Um, I do remember that. I was there for that. I was up. I wasn't even living in the state, but I saw that she was there and she was getting interviewed. Um, and it was an incredible interview and I really enjoyed it. So good job. <laughs> very much. Um, Sam, anything else tonight or? This has been wonderful. Thank you. I, Michelle and I were both nodding. We were there to meet Cheryl. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. It's a, it was a great event, but this is a great event too. And, and I just really want to encourage people. We do have one more question. So um, I want to, I want to make sure we get to it. And, uh, and I want to encourage you to go buy this book and buy it at Bear Pond, support your local independence. They're the heartbeats of our communities and they support writers like Chelsea um, in a way that Amazon does not in a way that Barnes and Noble does in other places. They actually curate books because they read them and they care about the writers. So Alexis wants to know, you're not off the hook yet, Chelsea. Um, you seem much more settled than Jess in the book. Do you think this book helped you to become more settled in who you are? And I see you're from Vermont. What made you leave? Oh man, okay, I'll do the Vermont one first. I might forget the first half of the question, but I'll start with Vermont. I grew up in Barrie, I lived there until I was 18, and then I left and lived in New Jersey for seven years. Um, and I came back for one year, and that's the one year that I met you, Tom. So I came back when I was 27, I think, um, and I left again. And I left for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them was the job scene. It's, it's pretty tough. I've lived in all cities and I was struggling a little bit to fit there. And also um, the darkness and the snow. Oh, yeah. uh, didn't well, help. We're, we're right in the middle of it now. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't help, especially if you're struggling with mental health. Um, it just was, it was really difficult for me. And I, if I could, I would live in Vermont every summer and come to Florida in the winter. Um, but I just didn't feel like I had enough. Um, I didn't have enough, like, of what I needed in that moment in Vermont. And I think now that I'm older, I'm looking at moving back to New England because it's just where I want to be. I just love it. Um, and then the first half question was about if I think the book helped me settle a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you seem more settled than Jess. Do you think the book helped you to become more settled in who you are? Yeah, if you guys saw me four years ago, you would not say that. <laughs> I was not very settled. Um, I think the book definitely helped me uh, subconsciously create a path for myself. So sometimes when you're in the thick of it with mental health, you can't even see where you want to go. Um, and for me, I couldn't figure that out. So I wrote a book and I had to fictionalize it from, to figure out how I wanted to, where I wanted to go and how I wanted to get there. Um, and I think writing is statistically proven to be really healing, whether you're doing fiction or nonfiction, there are lots of studies that prove it helps you to heal. It helps you, um, come out of sickness. So anybody that's struggling, I just say put the pen to paper, even if you're just journaling once a day, doing a paragraph, I think it helps. Um, and if you're, if you need to fictionalize it, do it because no matter what, it's a way, it's a path out of wherever you are. Well, I'm glad you found that catharsis through your prose and gave us this beautiful book. And um, I'm really pleased people came out tonight to hear you uh, here in your hometown. And uh, and I think you're going to be someone we're all going to be watching for a long time. So um, I'm grateful to you and I'm grateful to Bear Pond Books and everybody else for inviting me to be part of your event. And uh, this has been super fun. And, um, and as Rachel says, thank you so much for sharing about your story. And I think everybody who heard you tonight probably feels the same way. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this, Tom. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, anytime. This is my pleasure. It's a total joy. If anybody wants to unmute, we can give a round of applause or you can even, there's a clap emoji. Yeah, I like to do those, but thank you. Um, this is really great. Thank you again, Kellogg Hubbard Library. Thank you, Tom, for your time and your amazing questions. Thank you, Chelsea. I cannot wait for that next book, let me tell you. I loved the, I loved everything about this. I love the slightly creepy. I love the sex scenes because it's different from what I normally read and also normally experience, so it's nice to get another viewpoint. Um, maybe for the next book, you will be back in New England and we can actually have you at the store at Bear Pond Books. That would be fabulous. For sure, I would love that. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody said there's more comments. Thank you for sharing your story. Wonderful experience. You're both amazing. 
Um, thank you everybody for joining us on Zoom. We will share the link for the video on social media and our websites. Um, hopefully we'll share it out with more people who missed us tonight and they will learn about the fabulous book, Summer of the Cicadas by Chelsea. Thanks so much.